Thanks everybody for joining us today for our program, uh, Disaster Relief Funding Handling Immediate Needs and Building for the Future. We are very happy today to have uh, three wonderful panelists in, and speakers in Representative Jimmy Panetta, our representative of California District 20, Patricia McElreevy, the CEO of the Center for Disaster Philanthropy and Roxanne Cohen, the Managing Director for Community Impact with the San Francisco Federation and Community Foundation. And I wanna thank everybody for coming. Our moderator was uh, supposed to be Peter Teague, uh, formerly the Nathan Cummings Foundation and PT Philanthropic. We are missing him at the moment and I am working on raising him. So in the meantime, we will, we will work without him for the meantime. But I think without further ado, it's probably best to just you know jump right in because I know Representative Panetta's time with us is somewhat limited. So, uh, so Deborah, uh, who is our West Coast, the JFN's West Coast Associate Director, and I should introduce myself as David Heiser, VP of Programs with JFN. Uh, but since Deborah is, is uh, the representative's constituent and, and knows him from having worked with him recently, especially over the, the fires in the district and the response, why don't we uh, turn to you to introduce, introduce the Congressman. Great, thanks so much, David. And thanks. thanks so much to all of you for joining us. It's um, great to get to know Pat and I've known Roxanne for um, over 20 years. So it's, it's great <laughs> to have everybody together um, today. And um, so it is my pleasure to introduce Congressman Panetta. Um, Congressman Jimmy Panetta was first elected to Congress in 2016 as a representative to California's 20th congressional district after a career in public service. Uh, he served both in the military and as a deputy district attorney in Monterey County. In his second term as a Congressman, Jimmy Panetta serves on the House Committee on Ways and Means, the House Committee on Budget, and the House Committee on Agriculture. On a personal note, I'm fortunate to live in Congressman Panetta's district. I've had the opportunity to observe and experience his accessibility on a local level, along with his federal leadership as an advocate for critical issues facing our community and our country. I was first introduced to Congressman Panetta's team in 2018 during the campfire in Paradise, California. We had survivors relocate to our district <clears throat> who were in need of support to help recover documents they had lost in the fire to confirm their identity. They required advocacy after being repeatedly denied FEMA relief to which they were entitled. It was through his office that we received the essential resources that the newly arrived members to his district received. Today, Congressman Panetta's district sits in the center of five of the large wildfires that recently raged through California, causing unprecedented destruction. Relief work has been complicated by COVID-19 and the already existing economic strain challenging our country. During the fires and in their wake, Congressman Panetta has been a steadfast presence advocating on both a federal level and working together on the ground with local government agencies, nonprofit organizations, and volunteers like myself to access the support and resources desperately needed by thousands of his constituents who were impacted by the fires. Just this week, together with Congresswoman Anna Eshoo, Congressman Panetta secured a 30-day extension of shelter benefits for displaced survivors who are on the verge of homelessness. This is critically important. I'm working with these survivors personally, and I just wanna thank you personally for the important difference you've made in so many people's lives at this time when we have so much going on in our community and our country. So I, I personally wanna appreciate you and thank you. And I hope you'll all join me in welcoming Congressman Panetta to our panel today. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. I appreciate that. Uh, how lucky am I to have you as a constituent? Thank you very much. Um, but I, I think you really, uh, you hit on something that's very important that I'm sure uh, the Jewish Funders Network wants to highlight and wants to have me highlight. And that's uh, basically now more than ever, uh, government needs to work for people. And I think as public servants, I think if you ask anybody, especially now, um, that's really the obligation we have to live up to at this point. And don't, don't get me wrong. I know that there are certain uh, politicians who are tearing down are talking as if they want to tear down our institutions and are uh, basically espousing a lack of faith in our institutions. And let me tell you what we've seen this past summer is that now more than ever, our institutions, our government, our, our agencies, our bureaucratic agencies, they have to work for people. 
now more than ever. And, and I say that because obviously, um, you know, part of the reason I'm sure the Jewish Funders Network, which I appreciate uh, doing this, um, is, is experiencing, and, and what all of us are sort of experiencing is it, it's a little, uh, it's a little anxious. There's a little anxiety amongst all of us right now. At least that's what I'm experiencing from um, many of my constituents and even many of my colleagues in Congress. And and what would you expect, as I as I kind of term it, the the five E's that are going on from the epidemic, uh, the pandemic, the uh, obviously the the economy and the uh, self-induced comas, economic comas that we're putting ourselves in, uh, the uh, fights for equality, uh, the environment with our wildfires that we're dealing with, and then of course the thing that's going to happen less than a week from now called a national election. Uh, and so there's sort of, you know, there's all these things going on. And that I think just now more than ever, people need to have that rock of government actually work for them, not against them, not hurt them, but actually help them. And I think that's our job. That's why I'm glad you told that story back in 2018 about people who were coming into the district and basically needed that FEMA relief, didn't know who to turn to, came into my office, gave me a call. I basically acted as that bridge from the Central Coast of California to the federal government, in Washington, D.C., and back. That's my job. And I can't tell you how important that job is, not just in my role as a Congress member, how you see by just fulfilling those basic duties, to be honest with you, you can really affect people's lives. And basically, you, you can see that it, it affects them not just now when they need it the most, but it affects their future. And it's amazing that some people who run for this position and get into this position don't really realize how important those types of constituent services are. It's why I ran. I was lucky I kind of had a foundation um, of where, who my family is of basically seeing and hearing how important just doing your job as a re as a representative, not the policy aspect of it, but as the people and the personal aspect of it, that you really can affect people's lives. And I, I can't stress this enough: not just at the immediate with the immediate service service, but what it does in the future going forward. And I think you know what we've seen during this time. Um, I have to say, my colleagues and I, at least in Congress, have have definitely stepped up. And I think that's being from this community in which you understand, Deborah, how important it is to basically do something that I believe is what allowed us to exist here, but also allows us to go forward. And that's to just participate. We need to participate in our democracy more ways than one, obviously from the personal level, but also it's my job from the professional level, from the congressional level, from the federal level. And I think that we've done this. Just kind of let me give you a, a just let me start off with the pandemic. Uh, the first thing that we've been dealing with prior to the wildfires, and that without a real national strategy, unfortunately, in how we're dealing with this, um, you saw that void being filled through certain aspects of our government. And what I mean by that, it was sort of different layers kind of filled that lack of national strategy void, in that you had a strategy that came through it of federally funded, state mandated, locally executed. So it was our job to make sure the funds were there so that the locals on the ground who are fighting this pandemic have the resources, the funding for the resources to do their job. With the CARES Act, the $2.2 trillion record setting uh, relief package that we passed in Congress, we were able to do that, to be honest with you. Uh, here on the Central Coast, $1.4 billion came into the Central Coast that helped our businesses, our hospitals, our governments, uh, our farmers, our farm workers, which are so important here on the Central Coast, and really basically allowed us to get through this part of the pandemic. Obviously, more needs to be done. These are the negotiations you're hearing about right now in Congress. Now, what happened in the middle of this pandemic we were struck with those wildfires that you talked about, Deborah. Those, uh, obviously, in, in the month of August, uh, we had uh, in on the central coast of California, like you said, it had five wildfires that were either in or affecting my district on the central coast, our home on the central coast. Uh, you had the Carmel and River fires down here in Salinas over in Carmel Valley. You had the uh, Dolan fire down in Big Sur. You had the CZU fire up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And then you had uh, parts of the SCU complex fire that were just outside of Gilroy 
that is all my district. And so a lot was going on and it was my job to make sure that the resources were there. Now, kind of at the local level and at the state level, we were so fortunate to have our first responders and our firefighters basically run towards the fire that allowed us to run away from the fire and allowed so many people to run away from the fire. Uh, including myself, to be honest with you. You see me in a house right now. It's my house here in Carmel Valley. I was evacuated because I look out my window right over there. There were flames right on that hill over there. And so once they saw those flames, that was it. We cut, we packed up, and we, we, we went over to uh, my parents' house, which are about two miles down the road. But what happened a few days later? they got evacuated. So I call myself a double evacuee. Um, and, but I got, just kind of want to tell you a story about how that transpired. So obviously we're evacuated from, from our place here. We go to my parents, it's a Saturday afternoon. I think it's August 22nd. And prior to this, we had already put in our request to the federal government to make sure that there would be a major disaster declaration declared. Why is that important? Well, a major disaster declaration allows FEMA to then come in, the Federal Emergency Response Agency, to then come in and provide the resources necessary, get on the ground so that people can start to recover from these wildfires. Now, working with my wonderful partner, Anna Eshoo, uh, up there just north of me uh, in Santa Cruz, my neighbor to the north, our neighbor to the north, um, where that SCZU fire was just in her district, but obviously the people were coming down into Santa Cruz. Um, basically, we wanted to be there, provide those federal resources. And so we wrote to uh, FEMA, basically asking for a major disaster declaration to be declared. So it's Saturday the 22nd, and I get a phone call. Uh, the phone call was good news and bad news. The good news is that Santa Cruz County was declared a major disaster declaration, had that MDD, but Monterey County did not. And right after that, we get the notification, you're gonna to have to evacuate as well. So I'm trying to evacuate my parents, my family, yet get on the phone call and start going, what the heck is going on? Why didn't Monterey County get included in that major disaster declaration? And fortunately, I was able to basically call people I knew based on my relationships that I've established. Obviously the governor's office helped out tremendously. OES Secretary Ghirlarducci was an amazing help in basically, basically saying, okay, we're, we're on it. We need to provide data to Region 9 Director of FEMA, Bob Fenton. Called Bob Fenton, let him know we need Monterey County declared. I also then called my friends in the White House. What friends I have there in the White House is a Democratic Congressman from California, uh, but enough to where basically got somebody on the phone, got them to listen to me. And lo and behold, by Monday afternoon, Monterey County by itself was had the major disaster declaration because of the pushing that we had, because of that participation that I had to do to get that declaration satisfied and get the information uh, there to the federal government so that they can have that MDD. And therefore, FEMA was allowed to come in. And so it's, it's that type of work that we have to do in the federal government to make sure that the resources, the funding is there on the ground for the locals to fight the fires and do what they need to do to help people recover from the fires. I'm glad you mentioned that housing extension. That was very important um, in the sense that basically many of the people who were in the Santa Cruz fire, what the CZU fire, over a thousand, close to a thousand homes were burned down, unfortunately, up there in the hills of Santa Cruz. Now, once again, not my district, but coming down into my district and trying to find housing in a district that already has a, a, an affordable housing crisis, unfortunately. So many of the hotels were full with fire victims, but unfortunately, the funding that they were receiving to stay in those hotels was going to be terminated. I got to tell you, you know how it got on my radar? A constituent, uh, Michelle Avril, who you know from the Red Cross, uh, basically came in and met with me and said, hey, we need this to be extended. I was like, you bet. Let me see what I can do. Worked with Anna Eshoo again, sent in the proper letter. Boom, just this week, as you know, FEMA decided to extend that funding for those types of housing relief, for that type of housing relief that people were able to have who were victims of the wildfires. Once again, being that bridge to the federal government and back, I can't stress, is so important. And just doing our duties um, is actually how you affect people's lives in this role. Now, prior to that, what else did we do? Obviously, with the federal um, 
the fire management assistant grants, FMAGs, those were the first things out of the shoot even before the federal, um, the major disaster declarations, getting the federal government to come in and reimburse the local governments who are fighting the fires on a 75, 25% basis, which is very important. And then it's looking at areas like making sure the SBA is there, the Small Business Administration is there to provide the emergency, excuse me, the economic injury disaster loans, the EIDLs, making sure they're there ready to go. Now, making sure people were here to facilitate those types of loans, or at least uh, uh, directing them to the SBA and making sure it works smoothly. And obviously uh, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Now that had been up and running because of the pandemic and we actually increased it in the CARES Act for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. But at the same time, we were ensuring that the National Guard was here in the district at the food bank distribution. Second Harvest there in Watsonville and Santa Cruz County did a, an amazing job. And then uh, Melissa Kendrick down here at the Monterey County Food Bank basically accepted, took in the, the National Guard and they're out there every week handing out the food and the growing lines of people who are there for uh, nutrition assistance, uh, helping them out, which is very important as well. And then things just like the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, because as you know, once the fires go through and once people can start to rebuild, what do they have to do? They have to get a check off by the EPA to make sure everything's environmentally friendly in order to do that. Now, they once again, I, a good friend of mine, Jason Rada, whose house burned down up here in the Carmel fire, and I point that way, I'm pointing out to Keshawa where the fire was, um, you know, uh, his house burned down and he's a construction guy. So he's like, I'm ready to go. That's his attitude. Let's go. I want to build. Can't do it right away. You got to get permits from the county in order for the permits from the county to come in. EPA has got to give that check off. So he called me. I called the EPA. We got the EPA in there. Boom. Checked it off. He got the permit. Once again, making government work for people. I can't stress that enough. That's exactly what we're supposed to do. And, you know, so, so going forward, what are many of the future issues that we're going to be having to deal with? You know, obviously, it's another, it's another relief package that has to get done. And we have, a, a, as you know, uh, Deborah, we have affordable housing issues here. And so we have to deal with that here on the Central Coast and making sure that the grants continue to come in, uh, making sure that there is low income housing tax credits, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, what I would like to do is I'm gonna be introducing a bill, reestablishing the first time home buyers tax credit. Again, we don't get that anymore. And I think that's something that, uh, um, an administration who's a little more friendly could, could look at, I think is, is smart to do. Um, and then of course our environment. How do we look at these, um, what's happening here, uh, especially in California and start to deal with that? And I, you know, I'm, I'm really sick and tired of people trying to make this a binary choice. This is not a binary choice. We can deal with the climate crisis and we can deal with our federal forests at the same time. That's why I introduced legislation called the Climate Action Rebate Plan to cut our carbon output through a fee-based system and then reinvest those fees into communities who have been hit the hardest by climate change. But at the same time, dealing with all the federal forests, especially the ones that we have here on the Central Coast, making sure that those dead and dying fuels are reasonably able to be removed, making sure that we have a reforestation projects that are actually funded and are working. We have a backlog in those projects right now, and those need to be funded and need to be working. And I've introduced a bill as such, and then making sure that we have enough personnel to not just suppress fires, but to work actively throughout the year to prevent those fires. And the US Forest Service needs more personnel to do that. And so it's continuing to do this type of work that I think is important. Now, obviously, philanthropic, philanthropic organizations were, were so important and are so important uh, to the Central Coast of California. And we're so lucky to have them, especially like the, the, the JFN, who are here on the ground providing that type of help. And I mean, I think, you know, seeing that government can work, seeing that organizations like the Red Cross and community foundations actually do work. And my, my suggestion would be continue to tie into those types of organizations, uh, credible, um, legitimate, established organizations that understand what to do right away and continue to support those types of organizations, not to dissuade individuals, from their own giving or from their own participation, that's very important. But what I've seen 
Uh, it's basically looking at these organizations that are on the ground who understand the neighborhoods, understand the people. They're in there already. Continue to support them and bolster them up as much as possible, considering there's already a framework in place upon which that help can be given out to the community, which I think is very, very important. But what it comes down to, and I think it's important, is what we've said and kind of the theme throughout my talk and the theme through what you said, Deborah. It's about participation. It's really about participation, especially during these times, making sure our government participates, making sure our government works for people, but making sure individuals participate as well. And I do believe that's who we are. That's who we are as a country. That's who we are as a community, especially here on the Central Coast of California. And I think when we do that, that's how we get through these tough times. Because I think we got to look at our history. I can prove this based on the evidence. And the evidence is the history of our country. And what you got to realize is despite the most divisive of, of presidents, despite the most depressing of eras, we've always survived. And not just survived, we've succeeded. And why have we succeeded? Because we've done what we do best in this country. We get involved because we are a nation of we the people. So guess what? It's left up to we the people to do the work, to get involved and to participate. And that's why I think it's so important that the Jewish Funders Network is having something like this to inspire people to get involved and to participate at all levels. Obviously, I've talked about my responsibility at the federal level, but it's so important at the local level as well. Because you got to realize that that is kind of where it starts. And you got to look at an example like Rosa Parks. I mean, she didn't start out by taking on the laws of Jim Crow. She started out by taking a seat on the local bus. And that's kind of what it comes down to and trying to get people to realize that, yes, federal government has to work and it will work. You continue to engage with your federal government. But it also comes down to each and every individual to be engaged in their own way, be it on a personal basis, be it through an amazing organization like the Jewish Funders Network. So I, I hope that people understand that that's kind of what, what it takes to make sure that we survive these anxious times is to get involved, to stay involved, to be involved. And so I just wanted to say thank you and thanks to the Jewish Funders Network for getting people involved. Thank you, Congressman. Um, do, do you have a few minutes for, for a question? You bet, Peter. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, I, I got my Good. start uh, as a Panetta staffer uh, working in your dad's DC office. So I'm, I'm very happy to be, uh, be wow. able to talk to you this morning. I, you, so, so you know, you you know exactly what I mean when it comes to serving constituents, because that was a priority for for them, and and my mother, who I'm sure you worked with, who was his district director, and uh, it's a priority for me. Your mom was on the phone every morning, first thing to remind us. <laughs> Absolutely, um, right. yeah. So you know, welcome you're working. To, welcome to my life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I think you've done a wonderful job of kind of uh, convincing us the case that, you know, it's all, this is, all comes down to relationships. Um, you know, and when I think mm -hmm. back to when I was working on the Hill, um, when your dad was in office, disaster relief was something that all Americans came together on. There was never a question uh, in the Congress, in the House, in the Senate, you know, the members were going to vote for disaster relief. Uh, and we've now come to a place where that's no longer true, necessarily. Yeah. And I, I guess I'm wondering, you know, in the in this time of COVID, some of the things we're hearing is that um, the faith and the belief and the need for government is growing. People are understanding that they need to rely on each other and in government. I, I guess my question is your prognosis. You know, have we bottomed out on this lack of trust in each other? What's your prognosis going forward? Um, look, I you know, I'm biased. Okay. And I'm in this job because I'm biased, because I actually have faith in our government, because I have seen and heard firsthand how government can actually help people. And Peter, I, I got into this job not because I wanted to go back in DC and create some grand policy. Don't get me wrong, that's part of the job. But I, what I saw, and my, you know, my parents did a good job keeping us out of politics, to be honest with you. They did not want us to live their lives. They wanted us to live our own lives, for better or for worse, we did. Um, also why we went to local junior colleges after high school, but then we went on to do other bigger and better things. But what, what happened was when I got outside of the house and how people, even to this day, make it a point to me to tell me, probably the work that you did as a staffer, about how they were running into a personal issue. They didn't know who to turn to. They went to their Congress member's office 
and they got help. They got assistance, be it on an immigration issue, a social security issue, an IRS issue, a veterans issue, a military issue, an issue with the federal government. They got help from their Congress member. And let me tell you, it didn't just affect them. It affected their family and that affected their lives here on the Central Coast. So that's why I ran for this position because I saw that in this position, I can affect my friends and neighbors here in the place that I've always called home, Central Coast of California. And that's why I have faith in our government. And it's unfortunate that we do have some leaders who never experienced that, never um, had to rely on the government or looked at the government as something that was in the way of their selfish progress, to be honest with you. And I don't look at it that way. And I think people are starting to realize, like you said, Peter, I think you need it, nailed it. And that's why I started off my, my, my talk. In times like this, the government is a good thing. The government helps people. And basically we've seen it throughout these um, uh, uh, tragedies that we've been experiencing as a country, as a community, from the pandemic uh, to the fights for equality to uh, what I say now, the environment and dealing with the wildfires. You step in, you got to lean into it, but it takes leadership in our government to do that. And so I think people are starting to see, despite um, the lack of progress on a second pandemic, major pandemic relief package, and despite having a president who is constantly belittling and um, tearing down uh, our institutions that can help people, I think they know that on the ground, they're seeing government work for them. That's my job, that's what we do. But it also is making sure that organizations like the Jewish Funders Network are involved as well. So that community foundations, Red Cross and other local organizations are working as well. And I think that's important to realize that it's not just about government working, it's about these other nonprofits that are working as well and supporting them as best as you can. And that starts to give people faith in a bigger thing, bigger institutions. And I think that's important right now. And so despite what they see when they turn on the TV, um, I do believe that if you talk to people on the ground who have actually gone to their public servant's office or their government service office, um, now more than ever, they're getting service. And I do believe that that's starting to, despite the divisiveness we're experiencing at a national level, at the local level, you start there and it will trickle up. And that's what we've tried to do. Congressman, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you're able to stay to, to take questions from sure. other folks on the call. I also wanna bring in our other panelists. Um, and um, Patricia, you know, you've got this, this unique position in philanthropy um, and you're, you're doing your job at a point where as the Congressman pointed out, this, could, this has never been more relevant or more obviously relevant to all of us. Um, I wonder, uh, Patricia, if you could just sort of tell us a little bit um, about this so in this moment uh, when in the time of coronavirus and you could say that we're, we've all become disaster funders, um, what, what, what makes an effective disaster funder? Yeah, I, well, first, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, um, Peter and, and the G Jewish Funders Network, Network for having us and, and represent Representative Panetta. I mean, boy, I, I just want to go out and like put lights around my DC statehood sign now because, you know, we just need this type of <laughs> representation at, at every level in this country. And I just don't think we take, um, I don't think we appreciate it enough. Uh, what difference a strong representative um, can make to constituents in, at the federal level. I just want to give a bit of a shout out. You kind of had me um, misty eyed about what we're missing. <laughs> um, not, not that our mayor is not great, but it's a different thing. So um, I just, in terms, before I get into the disaster philanthropy, if I, if I may, Peter, I just want to talk a little bit about CDP and our origin. So the Center for Disaster Philanthropy was created to kind of fill a gap. And, and the representative kind of alluded to this, which is, you know, the federal government, the government, your local government, the business associations, they can only go so far in, in helping communities. And philanthropy, you know, CDP was formed because we saw that there was a lack of predictability in disaster philanthropy and who else could help, how else could they help? And, and not because of a lack of desire, but how do you help? There's so many choices, there's so much need. How do you direct yourself? How do you be strategic? And, and CDP kind of came in to say, well, we can guide that. We do that in three 
three main ways. And, and what, you know, the goal is to try and leverage the power of philanthropy to help communities recover equitably, to help communities recover better than they had been before, if possible. And we do that, as I said, in three ways. One is, is just an expertise, an expertise, a depth of expertise in disasters, in who responds in disasters, the phases of disasters, what philanthropy is and the options there. So just a real depth of expertise within the team. The second piece is just allowing others to access us for that expertise. And some of that you know, is, is given out for free and some of that's through arrangements where we help philanthropic groups kind of talk through consulting, trying to help them figure out their strategy. What might it be? How do they define what, where they wanna give? It's always best to have a plan. You may not follow through on the plan in the end in terms of how it actually looks, but without a plan, you're, you're often paralyzed in how you might wanna work. So we try and help people um, define that plan. And the third piece is a fund where we, we have multiple funds. We have one for the California wildfires we've had for multiple years now where people can act, philanthropic organizations or corporate philanthropy can put money into CDP and we help get that money as local as possible. And, and that's often not because others don't have the capacity to do it, but they wanna get that money local and there's a lot of effort that goes into getting it to that level. And we provide that grant making expertise, helping with the vetting, helping to get the funds that much further. So taking it that, that, that extra mile that maybe a, a large organization wouldn't be able to because disasters is not where they focus their energy, they don't have the relationships, whatever. So that's a little bit about CDP. In terms of becoming a disaster philanthropist, I mean, this one, this one is actually, I think, in many ways, and I really appreciate it, you know, these five E's that we're dealing with right now, because it's similar to what I've been talking about when I talk about disaster philanthropy. At CDP for ages, you know, ever since we were formed, we say everyone's a disaster philanthropist, but it's just kind of a way to get people to think about being a disaster philanthropist. Now it's so real. We all, because now everyone knows. You, There's not a person on this earth at the current moment who doesn't know what it means to live through a disaster. It feels different to everyone. People have different capacities. They have parents that they can evacuate to just down the road. They have, you know, people who have no nowhere to go. I mean, we know that disasters, they're not equal opportunity. You know, they, they, they impact people very differently. And what, um, but we all know what it feels like to have our life turned upside down. And that I think is what's really critical for us to kind of at this moment to remember because empathy only takes us so far. And when we see suffering on the media, on, on the news, somewhere else, we can almost detach ourselves. We maybe we write a check and we're done. But I think with COVID, we now hopefully will have a community that we know what it's like and we can we can think through the longer term. So, so a few things that I would say in terms of how to be a good disaster um, a philanthropist, I think that there's three three things I would advise, and it's pretty simple. It's it's not this isn't rocket science. I mean, the first thing is listen uh, to those closest to the crisis. Really hear what they're seeing, what they need. Um, we all too often we have hubris. We 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 know what you want. We know what what's needed. We're going to ship it in before you even ask for it. Um, we need to listen to people on the ground more because every disaster unfolds differently for every community. As I said, it's not an equal opportunity. Some people will need one thing, others will need another, and we need to listen to that. The second piece is be flexible then in what you're willing to give. Um, allow those on the ground who are helping the people on the ground to have flexible funding so that they can say, you know what, we thought it was gonna be this, but it's actually that. And we need to change our funding and not have to come back and fill out forms, and, but just actually trust those organizations. You've trusted them, you've chosen them, trust them to do the right thing with the funds you're giving them. And then the third piece is remember that the response is far from the end of the disaster. Um, you have your, your first moments and the recovery will take years for some people. And we can get into that separately, but recovery is, for COVID, for example, this crisis will not be over when a vaccine arrives. It, that is one point to the starting of our recovery. But there are children out of school that will take years to catch back up. There are people who've lost their credit rating for housing, for jobs, that will take years to get to back where they were. You know, there's health conditions that will continue. All of that is part of the recovery. And we need to remember that a disaster is not over the moment it goes off of our TV screen. It's over when everyone in the community has recovered equitably. And that takes us to get, we need to go beyond the response phase. So that's, I mean, the really critical part of being a disaster funder is remembering it's, it's you have to be in it for the long haul. Because if you really care about the community, they need you to take the long view. 
really important points. I want to come back to that. And then I want to bring Roxanne into the conversation. Roxanne, if you can kind of ground us in the, in the local work uh, through, the, through the Federation, that would be great. And tell us a little bit about what you do and, and how you're thinking about these issues. Sure, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure and privilege to be here. Uh, and I also want to thank specifically Deborah Feldstein, who called me in August, literally as the fires were burning around her in the Santa Cruz Hills and said, how can we mobilize a philanthropic response? What can we do in this moment? And uh, the result is this, uh, in part, this webinar today. It took us a while to schedule. Our conversation was in August, but I think it's really beshert, which means meant to be in Yiddish, that, um, that this session is today. Um, some of you may know that October 29th, um, today marks the eight year anniversary of Hurricane Sandy, which hit Staten Island and parts of New York. Um, Tuesday, October 27th, marked the two year anniversary of the Tree of Life shooting in, in Pittsburgh. And on top of this, we still now in California are experiencing the public safety power shutoffs. Um, just yesterday, Hurricane Zeta made landfall in Louisiana. This is the 11th tropical storm or hurricane to hit the US this year, the most ever in our history. So, um, so this conversation is for real. And I agree with Patricia that we all now know what it is to live through a crisis and a disaster and to, um, to think of ourselves as, as responders. Um, so my role at the Jewish Community Federation and Endowment Fund is to oversee our impact work in the area of communal resilience. This includes our initiatives and our grant making to foster the health and well-being of our community ecosystem. And there's a heavy focus related to physical and emotional safety, as well as community security and emergency response. And so as such, I've been involved with our wildfire efforts and our COVID response. Um, and again, I, I feel like this element of our work is more relevant than ever. And I, I appreciate um, Congressman Panetta's comments about the importance of a communal response of working through organizations like federations and community foundations um, because of our networks and the relationships that we have on the ground um, in the local communities, which can guide effective response. Um, and just another thing I'll, I'll, I'll share is the, um, the Jewish values element of, you know, for Jewish funders through this network, um, working with organizations like Jewish Community Federations, um, is, is that Jewish values really provide a roadmap for us. Um, pikuach nefesh, which is the principle of the primacy of saving a human life and preserving human dignity. Kihila, the power of community. Um, which includes the strength that we bring when we work together um, rather than you know, just as individuals. And also the idea that connection and belonging within community um, for individuals is really critical to their recovery. Um, and, and, and then finally, tikkun olam, the, um, you know, the, the power of uh, the obligation that we have to really work on repairing our world. Um, you know, when we convened a, our task force to uh, our volunteers and philanthropists to work with us in the 2017 fires, there was a member of the group who actually lived in Sonoma County, which was hit very heavily by those fires, who said, my hope is that this community will emerge stronger from this crisis than it was before. And, and again, I think this aligns so much with the, the principles that um, Patricia laid out that yes, we need to be concerned with pikuach nefesh, with, with the, the urgent human service needs in, a, in an immediate kind of way. But we also need to think through, you know, what does it mean to, to build communal resilience and to support the infrastructure of communities so that they can emerge even stronger. Um, I have more to say, but I can stop there and, and then, you know, allow for, for more. Um, discussion. No, thank you, Roxanne. I, I, I want to really pose a question for all three of you and, and get your responses, uh, maybe starting with the congressman. Um, thinking about crisis and the framing around crisis makes us think this is something that you do reactively and you do it in the moment uh, and then you move on. And, and Patricia reminds us of the importance of, of listening, of flexibility, and most importantly, this, this sort of the stick, be sticky, the stay, stay with uh, 
efforts that could be measured not in weeks or months, but in years. I think the challenge as a funder, you know, funders are being asked, hit by demands every day. How do you make that? How do you make that move? How do you stay in it for the long haul when the world keeps moving? And even as recovery may be going on for years, thousands of other things are hitting your desk every day. How do you make that long-term commitment? Congressman, if you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it, I think it gets back to, you know, a, a style of governing. Okay, there's, there's, there's governing by crisis or there's governing through leadership. And I think your question is focused more on the latter of governing through leadership, which is basically doing things that are not necessarily right here, but way down here. Uh, base, base, basically making sure you take steps to deal with that upcoming crisis rather than dealing with it when it's right in your face and you're already on your heels. And I think what we've seen lately, uh, unfortunately, um, especially, you know, in, 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 and I mean this at the federal level, you see a lot of, of governing by crisis and it just can't get be like that. And so you do have to take affirmative steps to look forward. And I think, you know, a good example of that is uh, look at our environment and what we haven't done uh, when it comes to the climate crisis, uh, what we need to do uh, when it comes to address that issue. And yes, if we do something now, we may not see the effects of it right now, but we know that we are stopping further effects and hopefully remedying the situation. So why not do something when it comes to cutting our carbon? It gets back to look at our forest, look at our forest. Do we wanna constantly be on our heels and fighting these wildfires and just looking at suppression? No, let's start thinking outside the box and start looking at ways to look at prevention, not just suppression, prevention. Yes, like I said, we can do both. That means going into the forest and making sure there's a reasonable way to get out the dead and dying fuels that make our forest so susceptible, so vulnerable to these dry lightning strikes that we had in August that roared through the state of California. Making sure that we have the proper funding for more forest surface personnel who can be in the forest who can actually prevent these fires. I mean, a lot of our major fires were started by um, people unfortunately, and people in these lands that weren't supposed to be in these lands and weren't supposed to be doing things in these lands. And so making sure that there's funding there to do it. And it, it takes a lot of political will, it takes a lot of political courage to govern like that and to lead like that, but that's something we gotta get more of. And so I hope that we use these types of situations that we're in now to make sure that we govern by leadership and look at little long-term long -term thinking so that we don't have to deal with these pandemics and unprepared in the future. Congressman, thank you. That's it. I, I love that sort of really thinking about this in a different way. Patricia, I wonder how that applies for, for funders. Um, you know, how you kind of, I'm sure you hear this from funders all the time. How, how do you expect me to stay in this sort of long haul when I've got all these other demands on my resources? Well, I mean, I think one of the most important things to, to remember is philanthropy at its root as a language, you know, as a word is about humanity. It is about the betterment of society. So it is, it, 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 as the representative said, it, it shouldn't really be about like a crisis response. It's about what, what do we need? And if you look at a lot of the root causes, people are not vulnerable to a crisis because they are vulnerable to the crisis. They are vulnerable because society has made them vulnerable. We have created a situation where there are people who live in areas or live in houses or live in that, or, or the very climate, as the representative was saying, has created a vulnerability. And we, we can do a lot to diminish those vulnerabilities. It doesn't even have to be in response to a crisis or in a recovery phase. It can be just general mitigation work, preparedness work, because we know if we don't pay attention to this, it will turn into something for some people in our communities. And, and, and looking at how to raise everyone together. So I, I mean, one thing I would say is it doesn't have to only be in relation to a crisis that people can help people avoid crises. If you're looking at the root causes, if you're looking at societal norms, there is everything in everyone's um, you know, philanthropic um, you know, portfolio that probably addresses this to some degree. They just don't realize that they're helping people avoid crises. Um, and that's just something to keep in mind. That, that's very, keep doing what you're doing to help society. 
keep doing what you're doing for that betterment. That's a huge part of it. I mean, in terms of preparedness, um, the, the other thing is, is there are organizations such as CDP that are set up for the recovery phase. I mean, I don't want to make a plug, but that but that's what our funds do. We get money and we sit on it and we wait and we 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 put it out later when it's needed. So there there are other organizations that do similar. So invest in them in the early days where you feel you've got the money for that crisis, but knowing that the organization you've given it to is going to hold on to it for those later times as well. Um, so I think that you know there's definitely ways to do it in that sense. Um, I mean just Mitigation, preparedness, we never want to fund it. It, it, it. Going back to government leadership, I don't think philanthropy necessarily can take the, the largest lead on this, but there's a lot of work that needs to happen related to infrastructure, related to housing norms, related to you know, natural hazards are not in and of themselves a disaster. The, the biggest hurricane this year was what we call a fish storm. It will never hit land. It was in the Atlantic, it was a category five, Teddy. I mean, would have been disastrous if it hit any, anyone, but it didn't hit anyone. But it doesn't make it less of a huge hurricane. What makes it a disaster is when it starts to impact humanity. When we start getting, when it hits land and we start having crises as a relation to it. So making sure that we have this, you know, one, that we avoid these storms as much as possible. You, obviously we can't necessarily, define the path of a hurricane once it's formed, but we can do a lot about climate change that will stop having as many form in the way that they are. But two, making sure that people that live in these areas that are cyclical, um, you know, uh, disaster zones, because they just happen to be, I mean, what, this is the fifth hurricane to hit Louisiana. That is a cyclical zone of disasters. So what are we doing for those communities to make sure that we are looking at how to prepare them better? What systems are we putting into place? What is our housing regulations? What are we exploring? And philanthropy does have a role here in both advocating for this, but also possibly in, 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 in lobbying, calling for it more effectively. I don't think though that you know we're necessarily gonna be doing all of that, but the government has a role in that and we should be calling it out because we need to be better prepared. Um, we need communities to be better prepared. And um, so one, we can avoid them and two, we can we can help them be prepared for them so they're not impacted as, as much. Um, so there's a lot um, that uh, can be done when both, you know, that has nothing to do with the actual crisis itself. And I think, it, it, I think the representative said it best. It's about leadership. It's about looking, what is your overall goal and how do you, how do you fulfill that promise um, to the communities you're working with? being attentive to it. Um, the way, just on an ending note here, I always say like, no matter how great your, your program is, if you're not looking at the fact that there's a risk of disasters in some shape or form, you, you're just letting your Achilles heel march on. And sooner or later, it, it, it's at risk because it is just by definition, um, your risk factor. And so you always need to look and plan through that. And that will help your communities that you're working with uh, be better prepared. Thank you. Roxanne, um, you've done a great job of grounding our conversation in the wisdom tradition of Judaism. I wonder you know, how you, how, what you bring, what, what uh, the, the tradition brings to this question of, you know, are, we, are we simply addressing crisis or as the Congressman suggested, you know, what, what kind of leadership does this suggest? Yeah, well, actually, I um, I, I also want to comment on, on the last question, which is really about um, you know the role of philanthropists and, uh, and and how they and I just want to take a moment to acknowledge and honor how generously our community has responded through all of these disasters, and I hope that the the positive the endorphins of feel good of giving and supporting um, will actually carry us for a very long time. Um, some of you may have seen just yesterday, the Chronicle of Philanthropy uh, released a survey that it did of 116 large charities that indicated in the first six months of 2020, overall giving was higher by 21%. And in the second quarter, April through June, giving spiked by almost 41%. And they also reported that increases were from, you know, the affluent people who you know, after a, an initial COVID jolt, we're, we're feeling very, very good. Um, and as well as in small increments that um, some 
organizations saw checks in the amounts of $600 or $1,200, which is the amount of the federal stimulus that they received and with notes to organizations saying there are people who need this more than I. So, um, so I, I want to stay on that. And, and again, knowing that we are, we're talking to, to a philanthropic community that we do need to, to invest for the long haul. We do need to remember that, that um, our, our community needs are, are escalating as we you know, continue to see these cycles of disasters. Um, and again, now to the, the question of you know, what, is, what is Jewish community or how does Jewish values look at the, um, the ideas of uh, of preparedness, um, you know, I, I, I think that there, there has been a lot that's been said already. What we looked to do in our um, Federation's 2017 wildfire response, um, again, once we made sure that there were initial needs that were met, um, we worked with our community on funding um, preparedness work with a, an expert consultant in the area of emergency response and planning worked with 10 Jewish community organizations and synagogues based in Sonoma County so that they could develop their own emergency response and preparedness plans. And I really believe that that paid off in spades, um, both as far as their response to COVID and their, um, what, what they were, how they were able to um, mobilize for evacuations, for early care, for evacuees um, during this recent fire. I also, something was just brought to my attention um, that I just uh, in the last couple of days, which is a um, disaster and religion app, which was, which is um, intended to help disaster responders better serve our diverse religious communities and build partnerships with religious leaders um, with easy, easily accessible um, religious literacy information on 27 religions. This was created by a national disaster interfaith network um, and the New York Disaster Interfaith Services and the University of Southern California Center for Religion and, C and Civic Culture. So I, I was really amazed by that. And, and I think that um, there's such an important connection between our religious and spiritual communities, our, um, our, our uh, volunteer social service network and um, our emergency frontline responders. Um Congressman, I'm, I'm alerted that you may need to leave us before the top of the hour. So I wanted to give you an opportunity maybe to, to jump in with any, any, any last words. No, look, I think, uh, you know, this is a great example of uh, what our community is about, uh, you know, here stemming from the Central Coast all the way back to Washington, D.C. with the good work that Roxanne and Patricia and, of course, having someone like Deborah uh, here on the ground. I mean, it's uh, it really is about people just getting involved and participating in any way possible. I can't stress that enough. Obviously, in my role, it's making sure the government works. In your role, it's making sure you get people motivated to come together and to do that, to participate, be it through uh, financial means or be it through physical means of actually getting out there and, and helping out. And I think, uh, to me, that's what's so great about uh, our community on the central, central coast. I can say that selfishly, uh, but also about this country and that that is the kind of the backbone of it. It's about people getting involved. And so I just want to say thank you uh, to the Jewish Funders Network and thanks to all of you uh, to continue to do what we do best. And so uh, I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, I appreciate uh, you allowing me to sign off here at attend my next uh, great next Zoom meeting. Can't wait. But that's what, we got to, that's what we're doing these days. So, but thank you guys. Thank you very much. And thanks, Peter. Appreciate it. And thanks, Deborah. I'll keep asking. I'll ask one more question and people can think about their questions. Um, I want to go back to uh, the framework that, that Patricia, Patricia suggested around uh, listening, being flexible, um, and, and you know, just the, the time issue that recovery can take years. So the, the, the importance of flexibility and the importance of patience. Um, Deborah, I wonder if you could, if, I'm sorry, uh, Patricia, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that framework and how you know, the folks on this call should be thinking about themselves as now all of us, as you said, all of us now being disaster relief funders. Um, uh, what kinds of suggestions do you have for funders on the call? What, what, what should we be considering um, in terms of you know, immediate needs and then thinking out as we shape our funding for the next year and beyond. 
Yeah. Well, I, I think first I would just like to echo Roxanne's comment about the generosity of philanthropy uh, this year. It, it is well worth noting um, how how amazing and generous it has been, and especially related to COVID. But even beyond COVID, in, in response to the other disasters, we've, we've heard people say, well, we're tired, we're, we're, our corpus is done, but it, it but they still keep giving. And so I do think, you know, that's really, we need to recognize that folks are digging quite deep this year. And um, that, that, that's really something. And, and money's not the only way people give. They're giving of their time, their energy, um, and, and that's also critically important uh, right now as, as, as it's a difficult um, year. In terms of ways people can give, I mean, a lot of this is in terms of longer term commitments. I mean, research shows that giving slows down. I mean, it's natural, five to six weeks, we forget, we forget. If it's not in front of us, we, we move on. Um, there's other things that come up and so that longer term recovery doesn't happen, but but what is it? What is it when I mean? What do we mean about longer term recovery? I mean, it's it's mental health, um, affordable housing, food security. Again, that the food security, uh, you know, the, we all too often think it's about like a feeding program, but food security are those, you know, food drives that we're seeing. You know, people having to stand in line to get food for their families to augment uh, what they get already through through different resources. Livelihoods takes a, a big hammering in a disaster. And, and sometimes again, livelihoods, we think of it as just your job. Do you have your job? You've kept your job, you're okay. Well, maybe you lost your car in a disaster and you have to drive to get to your job. So, you, you know, how, what is the whole of the person? What is the whole of the family? What is the whole of the community? And what might the needs be? And this is where I say, it's really important to get local because from afar, you, you don't know what the situation is. As I said, for example, with the car, I mean, maybe you're thinking, oh, it's okay, they can take a bus. Well, maybe there's no buses on a, in option as an option. And so what are the ways that the community can help grapple and work towards um, recovery? Um, and that's why it's really about flexible, sustained funding that allows um, the organizations, the nonprofits, and they can be a faith-based, as Roxanne said, there's a huge amount of faith-based organizations working and doing incredible work. There is, they could be, you know, non, uh, they could be secular, however it might be, there's a lot of different organizations helping and to try and find them and work with them. Not all of them are big, like some of them, you know, this is why uh, disaster funding can be complicated for, for some um, foundations is, you know, we, we want to give out like one large grant or one large funding to a situation, but these organizations can't absorb it. So that's another thing. When you think about funding flexibly, it's also might need to be in, in kind of smaller pieces than you're used to because that's what they can absorb. They, they have a smaller um, mindset or not um, a programming um, uh, pro profile. Um, we try and really think of disaster recovery as the process of improving the individual, the family and the community resilience. Uh, resilience is a little bit over overused as a word. So here we don't mean resilience as in like, oh, um, isn't it great? They're managing just in this really hard situation. Isn't that wonderful? We mean about actually allowing them to choose how to grow and how to be able to manage their way through a disaster. And that, so I think, uh, sorry, it, it's one of those terms that I think we, we use and it allows us off the hook a little bit. And that's not how we're trying to use it at CDP. We're trying to use it as a way to like reinforce that the community is in charge of their own recovery. And we are there to support their own recovery and they get to determine it. Um, and looking at the restorations, what are the structures, the systems, the services that may be needed? So again, thinking through that whole of, of need and working with organizations that are able to work within that. And um, I know there's questions coming in, so maybe I'll pause there um, and, and we can see what other questions there are. Yes, great. Um, let's let's. Uh, we have a, a question from, um, and and Roxanne, I'm going to ask you to to respond to this maybe first. Um, how can we best avoid fatigue among funders with a steady stream of disasters? Yeah, well, it's it's a very good question, um, and, and I I'll I think that there's a number of ways to look at that. I think first of all, we have to communicate with our funders about the impacts that they're having. So again, we can sort of boost those endorphins and, and help them really understand and see the impact of, um, of the work that they're doing. And you know, so that more will breed more. I also think we have to look beyond our, our traditional network of funders and, um, and think about people out there, again, recognizing that, um, that, that, that there are so many people that have the opportunity to, to give in, in large or small ways. 
Um, but another thing that we've done at our federation during COVID, which was really exciting, was, was look at some innovative ways to mobilize the philanthropists in our network, particularly around impact investing. So at the um, beginning of the pandemic, we had an outreach from our colleague, the executive director of the, our, the Hebrew Free Loan Association in our community, who was reporting right away um, the increase in demand and need for interest-free loans for people who had been directly impacted by COVID, either lost jobs, uh, closed small businesses, and so on, health needs. Um, and we were able to mobilize our uh, over $5.9 million from within our donor advised fund, supporting foundation, and our own endowment fund in the form of a recoverable grant, um, which is an impact invest in, investing strategy where um, the funding is going to Hebrew Free Loan for five years for use in the community for philanthropic purposes, but then we'll come back to um, to the funders to be recycled for, for additional philanthropy in the future. Um, we saw a lot of excitement about this among um, within our network because it was a unique way to approach a very complex problem and philanthropic solution. So, so I think that that's important too for, for those of us who are in the position to um, work either with you know, private foundations or through community funds to be able to, to think a little bit differently um, that, that there might be multiple ways to, to give and invest. Um, Patricia, I, you might want to let everybody know sort of the geographic reach of your organization, which has been asked about. And also then maybe if you, uh, you want to talk about this question of, of dealing with donor fatigue. Yeah, I mean, well, so Center for Disaster Philanthropy, we do domestic as well as international. So we have both. Um, there's a, we don't stand funds up for every crisis, but we, we, we stay engaged and involved with all the disasters happening across the world, um, trying to look at how do we guide um, organizations and in, in, in how they work within them. Um, donor fatigue is, that's the age old question, right? I mean, in, in some ways, I always feel like what we should challenge ourselves a little on this, because why is it always the same donors doing all the work, right? That's where the fatigue comes from. Um, we almost need to look at why are some of the very large, um, uh, those with the high net worth individuals and organizations in this country are not giving in, in a way that others are, right? So that's a challenge to ourselves is how do we kind of create a drumbeat where philanthropy is really rewarded, is supported, is encouraged, um, and, and it's not, you know, uh, and so that's one thing is that we need to share out of it. Um, I don't like the frame burden sharing. That's what the US government will call it in the international um, humanitarian sphere. But in some ways it is about sharing the cost and sharing that philanthropy um, spirit in a wider way. So the needs are, are, are across more. One, one advice that we give to organizations when they're looking at that concurrent disasters, how do I give so many choices? Have a strategy. What type of working with what crises will you does your organization work in? Maybe you're very geographically focused. And then it's hard to say no to everywhere else, but you maintain your focus in one area. Um, you know, California wildfires, for example, or California Foundation, we're very focused on California. Maybe we help in other things when they're very large, like the pandemic, but overall, this is where we focus. Or maybe it's types of crises. You're very focused on children needs as, as your organization as a whole. So you've decided that your disaster response is gonna be very directed towards helping children and their needs. And, and how that might play out. So it really, in some ways, is um, if your strategy is the first ones that come and then it's over, you're probably going to wind up being frustrated for quite a lot of the year because if a big disaster or crisis hits early in the year, that might be what you respond to. And, the, and then the rest of the year, you're feeling like you're saying no to everyone and, and maybe feeling frustrated with that. So it, it is having a strategy, thinking that through and planning. Um, but to be honest, in years like 2020, I mean, yeah, I, 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 it, fatigue is just everything, everywhere for everyone right now. And you just need to be kind to yourself. Um, you know, organizations are going to be asking you for money. And deep down, they know that you probably are tapped out. But they're going to ask anyway, because everybody has so many needs this year. So I, I think it's just that transparency, having those trust-based trust -based relationships and really being able to be honest with each other and say, I'd love to help, but I just can't this year. And this is why, or this is why we can't help here. And people understand. I mean, I think we all are in, we're all in the same boat together. Um, so that fatigue, I think is, um, 
you know, it, it is, a, it's real. I mean, there is an empathy fatigue, people just get tired. And, and I think it's, we have to, we have to be forgiving with each other about it um, and look at how we work through it in our personal connections and relationships that pre-existed the disaster. And that will help us get through the, the current crisis. Can funds donated to CDP be, be directed to a specific disaster? They can, yeah. We have uh, we have actually standing funds for specific crises. So you can, if you go onto our website, you'll see some of them. But like we, for example, we have a California wildfires. We have um, now a Colorado wildfires. They asked us to stand up. The governor's office asked us to stand up one. So I think we try not to stand up too many funds that kind of divide our our the resources. We we do. Um, but there are certain crises where the needs are so great that we have stood up a specific fund for it. We have one for the Atlantic hurricane season. So there's a few that are kind of evergreen in the sense that we stand them up regularly because they are cyclical crises. There's others like COVID that we have stood up specifically for that. Um, so yes, you can. What we ask you not to do, but it can donors can, can make these requests is to be too limited, uh, too restrictive in where you would like the funding to go. Because if you already know which organization you wanted to go to or which town you wanted to go to, we'd be happily we guide you towards that. What we ask is that you trust in us and our research that we are getting it as close as possible to the people on the ground um, if you want to go through our funds. I, I want to go back to something that the Congressman raised, um, which is uh, climate change. And you know, like COVID, this is something that is you know layered on top of all these other disasters. It's intimately uh, linked to a lot of these disasters, um, and it just makes uh, disaster relief that much more difficult, uh, and preparedness as well that much more difficult. I wonder how you how each of you thinks about climate change. Um, whether you see that as really a separate category that should be left to the climate funders, we're not going to think about it too much to deal with in, in this specific area, or if it is something that's on your mind, and if so, how? Uh, maybe we could start with Roxanne. Sure. I, I mean, I think it's becoming so obvious, the connection between climate and um, the impacts on our communities. I've seen our teens, another element of our work is I work with our, our Jewish teen engagement initiative. And um, of course, climate has been a, a key concern and issue among our teen community. We've seen increases in civic engagement and activism among our teens. And I think we have to follow their example and follow their lead. Um, as far as the Jewish community in an organized sense, um, you know, and something that Peter, we had talked about in, in, in the um, preparation was the role that the philanthropic community can play in advocacy on federal and state levels. Um, and actually my colleague from Jewish Federations of North America, Stephen Klein, I believe is on the call. Um, and he plays a leadership role um, with advocacy on behalf of our whole network of Jewish federations in Washington, DC. And we have looked and worked very hard on issues that um, look to protect the needs of nonprofit organizations, um, particularly during the COVID crisis. Um, we've also worked to advocate for uh, grants on federal and state levels to, for security, community security. Um, and in fact, in, our, our, in the state of California, we partner very closely with JPAC, Jewish Public Affairs uh, Committee, and um, work with the Jewish Caucus, Jewish Leg Legislative Caucus in Sacramento. Um, and with their help, they were instrumental in 23.5 million in funding, state funding, to help the rebuilding of Jewish camps that were destroyed. Um, camp Newman in Santa Rosa in 2017, and um, three camps in Southern California, and Jewish overnight camps in Southern California in 2018. Um, and I, I had a conversation last week with um, Julie Zeisler, who's the director of JPAC, and asked her, you know, has, has climate and climate change, um, you know, come into your thinking, our thinking, as far as our, our Jewish communal agenda. And it hasn't quite yet, but um, but I, I do really believe that it should. Thank you. Um, so Patricia, this is gonna be the last word. If we just have a couple of minutes, if you could give us your thoughts on that, on climate. I, I agree with Roxanne. I mean, we, we, we don't have the liberty to, to not see this. Um, it's it's coming and um, uh, it's it's there's a drum beat that's you know beating right faster and faster in terms of how it's going to impact us. Um, I mean three three things I would say is we, we need to trust the experts we need to trust science we we need to 
and 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 it seems weird that we ha we have to say that, but we do. I mean, unfortunately, um, we just need we need to find a space where where we believe that this is something that needs to be looked at um, and addressed. We we need to explore it. for philanthropy. We need to fund differently. Um, you know, by by looking at it, by valuing it, by seeing how it works, and 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 on the last point, I think we have to value collaboration. We're, everyone's not going to become a climate funder. You know, I mean, that's not what's going to happen. So you don't have to shift into that being your be all and end all. But how are you? What are you doing that can influence um, climate um, change? That can in, implement uh, mitigation efforts? And just looking at that. So it's the same for me a little bit with the disaster. It's, you have to look at these things in a much broader sense because they are impacting the societies you're serving already. And so, how listen to them? What do they need? Um, and what what might be some ways to address that? Great. I want to thank you both so much. Um, it's been a great conversation. It's gone really fast. Um, so for me personally, just thank you for a wonderful session. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to David. So great, thank you so much, Peter, uh, Roxanne, Patricia, and, and Deborah, of course, and to the Congressman in absentia and, and everybody here who's, who's with us on the call. Appreciate your, your participating today. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, there's nothing I can add to, to, to the conversation, but I really appreciate everybody's uh, you know, offering their, their experience and wisdom here. Uh, to the, you know, those of you on the call, I mean, please, uh, you know, continue to, if you're not getting our newsletters, please sign up on at jfunders.org. We have lots of great upcoming programs coming, uh, including, of course, our, uh, we're about to announce, but you'll get a little preview here of, of doing a, a full-scale uh, Western uh, Regional Conference on December 8th. Deborah, have I misremembered this? Should have looked it up. December 8th um, from December 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And it's for all of the Western states in our region. Um, and we have an amazing program coming up and it'll be up on the website in the next Which couple we're of we're going to announce pretty soon. And we're also, you know, formally uh, going to announce our 2021 March conference as a virtual event, March 15 to 17 with great speakers and, and a lot of interesting ideas uh, in play there. So be on the lookout for, for stuff. Uh, thank you all for coming and I will speak to you all soon. Thanks again.